two flats f and f prime that are incomparable. In other words, f is not included in f prime and f prime is not included in f. So they're incomparable with respect to inclusion relation. Then the product of those two uh, variables equals zero. And then we have some linear relations. So for any ground set element, let's say I, look at all the flats containing I, and then sum those up. And that needs to equal zero. That's the second relation. So that defines the charring of a matroid. Now, why is this important? So the key statement about this charring of a matroid due to Aripacito and cats is that this charring of a matroid, regardless of whether a matroid is realizable or not, satisfies a good, these three set of really nice properties, usually satisfied by cohomology rings of smooth projective heights. These are often abbreviated in this way. So the first property is point carry duality. Second one being hard left shits. Third one being the hot Riemann relations. Now, I won't exactly say what these are. Um, well, point card duality, I'm sure many of you are familiar. Um, really, for lock concavity properties, what's the most relevant is the Hodge Riemann relations, um, especially in degree one. And what that states is that certain matrices have exact, certain symmetric matrices have exactly one positive eigenvalue. So that should sound quite familiar already uh, from looking or from the definition of Lorentzian polynomials. And so the property, the hot Riemann relations is exactly what allows for applications to establish some lock and uh, cavity results in combinatorics. So in our case, so how was this established? The proof of this theorem is through induction within another induction. Um, so it's a nested induction where intermediate objects, um, some of the intermediate objects are not even matrix. So it's a uh, rather involved proof. And one way to cast our work um, with Spencer Beckman and Connor Simpson is, okay, how, can we establish these properties purely staying in the realm of matrix? And Turns out with some new ideas and combining this powerful tool called Lorentzian polynomials, it's possible to do it with a single induction to establish these properties that I just laid out. Um, that does not involve anything other than matrix. So it's just an induction on rank at the end of the day using our new approach. So how do we achieve this? Well, the main observation to start off is that these variables Z sub F in the geometric sense are not NEF. So this triangle matroid does represent a cohomology ring for realizable matroids. And geometrically, one can observe that these variables in the old sense are far from NEF, actually. So we need some new set of generators for this charring. If we want to apply the Lorentzian polynomial, we, we really need to start with some elements in degree one part of the charring that has property called NEF. And that's what got us to 
define the following linear change of coordinates for this chow ring, which we call the simplicial presentation. So what's the simplicial presentation of the chow ring? Let me just put this nabla underneath just to indicate that this is a simplicial presentation, distinguishing it from the usual. So this is exactly the same ring as the chow ring of matroid, but just with different variables called H sub Fs for each non-empty flat F with some relations. And it's defined by setting H sub F equals the sum of all minus C sub G, where G is all the flats containing the given F. So this is literally a linear change of coordinates from the original variables defining the charring of a matroid um, to just new set of variables that we're calling H sub F. Turns out if you order the flats by rank, this is a upper triangular change of coordinates. That's all there is. And a priori, this is unclear what this should or what this would even achieve. Right? It's just linear change of coordinates. But turns out it does quite a few things. So let me tell you what the first key property of doing this change of coordinates is. So, sorry, so you include the whole uh, ground set as well, right? So the whole. That's the right. Anymore. Yeah, so for those who are familiar with the work in AHK, they have a slightly different presentation of the chowering where they do not include the ground set. And that can be a small source of um, confusion. Here, so if you want to translate that to AHK, um, C sub F equals, in their notation, X sub F um, for every non-full ground set. So those are all the same. And the one that corresponds to the ground set this is in their paper, what they're calling minus of alpha in their paper. So it's almost like exactly the same presentation, but yeah, slightly different. And these are in an F? Uh, the H sub Fs will be in F. In, in the original presentation, either in this slightly different one I'm showing you today or in AHK, those variables are far from that. But these yeah. H sub Fs will be in F. Can you give me intuition about the minus sign? Ah, so... I mean, it seems to me it should be positive. I mean... That's it? right, yeah. So, uh, there are a few ways to justify the minus sign. Um, one reason is this kind of annoying thing about the min versus max convention. Um, here... I think the most natural way to justify it would be through geometry, really, mm -hmm. um, which is that minus C sub E in the presentation, this corresponds to geometrically the hyperplane class pullback. And what one is trying to do is I want to restrict where this hyperplane can be. And in the language of algebraic geometry, by subtracting from this minus E, the hyperplane class, some summation of more C sub Fs, where F is not ground set. So anything, this will look something like this. Um, by subtracting that part, I'm requiring this hyperplane to be on certain subspaces. So let me get to that. Um, in a moment, it will be one of the first key properties. Are there any other questions before I move on? I haven't really fully answered the most recent question, but I'll do so in a little bit. But any other questions? Okay, so let's get to the first key property. And it's that these variables called H sub F correspond to a pretty well studied operation in matroid theory known as principal truncations. Oh, 
paper in this case corresponding to f is a prin principal truncation of m by f. So this is an operation that outputs a new matroid on the same ground set from the old um, for according to any given flat f. And let me do it in an example from the one before. Also, meanwhile, answering the question that was raised earlier. So the variable C minus Z sub E, the whole ground set, represents um, in a fairly precise sense, a general hyperplane in this hyperplane arrangement. Now, if I'm looking at H sub, let's say zero one, this is minus Z of the whole ground set, let's see, zero one to three, minus zero one. Now, what subtracting this part does is that now, in a precise geometric sense called, you look at the sections of the line bundle defined by this divisor, one is to be precise. But basically, the punchline is that now we're looking at a general hyperplane that must pass through the subspace corresponding to your flat zero one. So the, the, in this case, the flat zero one corresponding, corresponds to this point and the variable H sub zero one represents a general hyperplane that contains that point zero one as drawn in green. And now let's intersect the original hyperplanes zero, one, two, and three and see how that intersects with this green one. And that gives us a new hyperplane arrangement drawn here. So the, we get a new matroid coming from this new hyperplane arrangement drawn on this green line. And the flats look like this now. So I've done this as like a kind of looking at the geometry of hyperplane arrangement. But in general, one can um, perform this principal truncation as follows. So I'm given a flat in this example, zero one. Look at everything above it. Let's circle that in the post set of flats that I've drawn. And kill everything that's directly below anything in this green bubble. So kills this one, this, this, this. And then move this bubble down one step. And then you'll see that once you do that, um, ah, it also kills one because one is directly below zero one. So once you move this bubble down one, you'll see that the resulting thing is exactly the lattice of flats that I've drawn here. So that's the operation of principal truncation. And it's fairly well studied in the theory of matroids. And that's the first key property that these variables have. That now in the old case, each variable has, it does have a um, interpretation combinatorially, but it's a little harder to use, especially when I'm trying to take, um, consider monomials in the variables. So first we have interpretation of these variables in terms of these combinatorial operations called principal truncations. One can upgrade this to monomials in H sub Fs. In fact, what we can show is that there is a monomial basis for the Chow ring in these variables H sub Fs. And they correspond to combinatorial structures that we call relative Schubert matrix. So this is not too important for this talk. But the point is that we can understand the ring quite well combinatorially by exploding this idea that each variable corresponds to a principal truncation now. And in fact, with this knowledge, 
again, this is a little more side remark um, for today's talk. But when can we cover point carry duality? With pretty much no induction. So just straight up point carry duality. We understand the basis of this counting of a matroid now. And with that, point carry duality is not that hard to prove. So already it's showing some, showing some promise that these variables are really nice to look at. Any questions at this point? So this principal truncation is always a matroid, right? Yes, so it's a matroid that one obtains by doing this process that I just did in an example. Mm -hmm. um, there's like a basis description of it, circuit description, like written down in Oxley's book or Brulowski's uh, chapter in uh, uh, Neil White's anthology. So combinatorially well studied, thankfully. Any other questions? Okay, so what's the second key property? So this is the part where one can really witness or get a hint of H sub F's neftness. So more precisely, let me tell you what's going on here. So what Poincaré duality for this charring of a matroid says is that we have a nice isomorphism map from the top non-vanishing degree part of the chow ring to R, just like homology ring. So let's call that integral M, just like the homology rings of smooth manifolds. And we want to compute the following, or look at the following polynomial, which I'll call the volume polynomial, abbreviated VP. And it will have formal variables in Z sub Fs, where Fs are non-zero flats or non-empty flats. It's defined as follows. So again, take formal linear combination over all non-empty flats. x sub f, h sub f, raise it to the power of d. So this is an element uh, in the degree one part uh, with just formal variables x sub f's, and then I raise it to the power of d. And now I'm applying this degree map to the whole thing. So this is the polynomial. The x sub f's. And one hopes that this is Lorentzian. So if we go back to this classical geometric theorem, if these elements in the degree one part of the Chow ring have some property called Neff, then this volume polynomial is Lorentzian. So that's the classical fact. And in fact, the hodge riemann relations is basically almost an equivalent statement to that fact. But we want to prove that this polynomial that I've just wrote down is Lorentzian without appealing to the works of Adipasi, Doha, and Katz. I mean, we're trying to give a simpler proof of it, so we shouldn't rely upon that. So can we show that this is Lorentzian just straight off looking at the definition of Lorentzian polynomials? And thankfully, the answer is yes. Uh, and in fact, it turns out computing this has some very nice combinatorial structure, uh, which I'll tell you about now. So what's the main statement? Well, to compute this polynomial, I need to be able to compute what the product of H sub Fs are for any multi-set 
of d flats. So I need to know how these degree d monomials evaluate under this uh, degree map. And d is the rank or d plus one is the rank? So d plus one is the rank, um, but the top non-vanishing degree part of the char ring lives in d degree. So there's like a minus one. So you can think of this phenomena as the subspace we're looking at is d plus one dimensional, but since we're working all projectively, it's dimension d. So I want to be able to compute this for any um, d many flats, where in this list, of course, some flats can be repeated. So any degree d monomials in h sub f, I want to know how they evaluate to under this degree map. And that's the theorem that I'll write down right here. And first off, right off the bat, something nice is that the value is always, always either one or zero, which is almost miraculous. But if you're thinking geometrically, this is like how it should be since we're looking at intersections of hyperplanes. So it's always one or zero and it's one in exactly, um, if it satisfies the following. So I look at the union of flats for everything in some subset J of D. The rank of that should be greater than size of J plus one, where J ranges over all non-empty subset of one through D. So pick any subset J of the flats in the list here, F1 through D, repeats aloud. Look at the union of those, look at its rank, and it has to be greater than the size of J plus one. And if that's satisfied for every subset I can pick, J, then the value is one here, it's zero otherwise. Now, for especially combinatorially minded in the audience, you'll probably look at this and think, oh, that looks awfully familiar. So instead of rank of the subsets of a matroid, if I had just size of the subsets, so not rank, then that looks awfully like the Hall's marriage condition. Right? Can there be matching? Except there's this plus one. And your hunch is actually right. So this encodes a matching problem. And I'll just kind of tell you a brief story of what this matching problem is. So I have some bipartite graph and there's a matching problem. And without this plus one, so let's say there's no plus one right now. If it's just size of J and then no rank sign here, but the size of the union, then that's exactly Hall's marriage problem. Now with this plus one added, this is what Alex Posnikov in his paper, um, Primitahedra, Socia, Hedra, and Beyond calls the dragon marriage problem. Uh, so the story is that, well, here's a matching between dudes and dudettes and now, for the dragon matching problem, a dragon will randomly come by and take a random dude away. It's unfortunate. Um, but the question is, can there still be matching? And um, this condition is saying, if it meets the condition with this plus one, um, it says that yes, there can still be a match. And finally, getting rid of these absolute value signs or the cardinality signs and replacing that by rank of a subset in a matroid. This is the, what one can think of as Rado's generalization of Hall's theorem. So the matching should satisfy a certain independence condition coming from matroid. And we call this the dragon hall Rado condition.
So we can understand these intersection numbers, these values of applying the degree map to any monomial in the H's very, very well. Like it has nice description. It's either one or zero, which is great. And also we know exactly when it's one by this matching problem. Let me make a brief remark. Evaluating the same thing, but with the Z sub variables, the original presentation, uh, this is pretty complicated. Like, first of all, it's not always one or zero. And of, also it's not even always not negative. It can be very negative, these coefficients. Uh, complicated. And giving a formula for this was actually my first paper. So now let's get to showing that our volume polynomial, VP of X's, is Lorentzian. So to show that this polynomial that we defined in the previous slide, as follows, to show that this is Lorentzian, sorry, please go on, yeah. Good question, the, the monomial you had for H is, is not uh, multi, linear, right? You can't have repetition. Yes, yeah. The repetition is absolutely allowed. And in fact, that's what makes the fact that repetition of the F1 dot dot FD, like there can be same flats in that list. Repetition is what makes this computation really quite difficult. If there's no repetition, the computation is quite easy. But yeah, repetition is absolutely allowed. So for any monomial, not necessarily square free, we're trying to evaluate this. And it turns out with this H variables, the values are quite simple. One or zero, and we know exactly when it's one. Ah, and I think I forgot to mention, um, this actually generalizes Postnikov's um, theorem on the volumes of generalized permutahedra. So of course it's an independent proof. And by setting the matroid to be the Boolean matroid, in other words, every subset is independent, uh, one recovers posting cost result. Okay, so now I want to show that this volume polynomial is Lorentzian. And well, to do so, we need to understand the support very well. And we do, this thing tells you what the support of this volume polynomial is. Because when I'm computing this, well, I just expand this out. I have a bunch of monomials in the HFs multiplied to monomials in XFs. And I know which ones are zero and which ones are not. So that's great. So I know the support pretty well through this theorem. And it turns out the support, well, first of all, is a polymatroid and it has a quite a rich structure that I think will be worth exploring. In fact, within the support of this volume polynomial, if you look at square free part, uh, consisting of rank two flats, it contains in it the Dil what's known as Dilworth truncation of the matrix. So I won't get too much into this, but it seems like Outside of just trying to show that this volume polynomial is Lorentzian, it has quite a nice combinatorial properties. Just looking at the support. Now, what about the partial derivatives? So say I wanna take a partial derivative by some variable x of f corresponding to a flat f of this volume polynomial. And from our first key property, this is more or less equal um, up to like few binomial coefficients and like such that. So basically equal to the volume polynomial or the principal truncation of that matroid by F. So it just knocks it rank one down by one and it's a smaller matroid on the same ground set. So if I were to do this D minus two many times, this gets me a volume polynomial of a rank 
three mates, right? So Chris, yes, uh, uh, isn't this just the uh, generating polynomial for the polymatroid? So I think you don't need to differentiate. So it follows follows except from this dragon condition that it is a polymatroid, and and what you have here is just the generating exponential generating polynomial for the uh, for this polymatroid. Ah. Um... Let's see. But you can do it this way too, but, but yeah, it's, sure. I guess yeah. it's a short, shortcut. Yeah, uh, I guess that's correct. Yeah. Maybe easier to understand. Mm -hmm. well. Yeah, so in either way, the point is that we can understand the partials very well and get down to just another rank three matrix. So we understand the partial derivatives pretty well. And rank three matrices are fairly easy to deal with. So with those two in mind, it's once one observes these two things, it's, it's like not too difficult to show that this polynomial that we wanted to show to be Lorentzian is Lorentzian. It's quite nice. So we conclude that this point polynomial is Lorentzian. So I'm pretty much out of time. And this is, what this says is that this polynomial is once again log concave and the positive orthant. In other words, in the induction scheme, it provides a key step. So in the Hodge theory of matroids, as laid out by Adiprat, Sito, and Katz, among the hardest parts is to show that the hot Riemann relations is satisfied for some ample element. And that's the part where they really need this kind of nested induction within another. But in this approach, using these variables H sub Fs, well, first we could prove the Poincaré duality without any induction. And now, borrowing this powerful tool, Lorentzian polynomials, or strongly locked concave polynomials, by showing that this volume polynomial is Lorentzian, we can show that kind of really difficult induction step where we have to show that at least one, there is at least one ample element satisfying hot Riemann relation without doing this nested induction, just an induction on rank now. So that's how this plays a role in that. So with that, um, I'll end my talk here. Yeah, thanks for a really beautiful talk. Uh, any any questions? So I guess one question is, can you get the higher Hodge-Riemann relations directly from this, or you have to do the induction? Ah, so that's a great question, and the answer is unfortunately no. Um, it is a big mystery to what extent Lorentzian polynomials encode any of the higher hot Riemann relations. I think, in fact, so far, we don't actually even know any combinatorial applications of higher degree hot Riemann relations, not just in the context of matroids, but also in like the context of simple polytopes and so forth. Yeah, I think there's, there are almost no applications of them anywhere except for one application. So. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that that's a big mystery. So maybe so, so when you when, when you want to prove the prove the log concavity of the say the character, characteristic polynomial or the the one divided by t minus 1 then you, you you actually need to to do some you, you need some elements to be in in the in the nep cone right mm -hmm. so is there some uh, do you see any and there you you need to sort of rely on some of the uh, theory of adiprasito and et al so can you is there some way you see that using your machinery that you can go around this so let's see 
So there, the NEF elements, so the alpha and beta, they call it. Um, the yes. alpha part is fairly easy to understand, but then the beta part is the tricky one. And the way I interpret their work is that, so by showing hot riemann relations uh, for sort of the biggest ample cone one can imagine, that's like the hard part. And to do that one, they had to do this whole induction to prove hot riemann relations. Yeah. And in general, I think by showing that if one has some sort of an induction scheme, um, which usually exists, um, either like for example in McMullen simple polytopes case or in this case, if one can show that certain polynomial is Lorentzian with respect to a very carefully chosen set of NEF uh, elements. So here, the beta one is actually not a positive linear combination of H sub Fs. So if I look at the positive cone of these H sub Fs, it's not the full ample cone. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. But in any case, by showing that this is Lorentzian, one can provide a key step in the induction and then extend the, the domain of ample cone for which Riemann, hot Riemann relation holds to the full thing where we need it to be, for example, in the characteristic polynomial case. So that's the scheme. Yeah. I mean, now you have a, well, your um, expression of the volume polynomial in your new variables is, are, is very beautiful and simple. So maybe there's hope for that you can sort of get a fully combinatorial proof of the whole thing. But maybe that's too much to hope for. Um, for all the hot Riemann relations or? No, so, so that you, so you still, still have to rely on some uh, theory of the original paper, but may maybe there's a sort of a um, pure combinatorial proof that you can get from your... Uh, yeah, that may be possible. Theory. Yeah, maybe we don't have to do this induction scheme at all, just... Yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah, that's... Unclear but, to me at the moment. Yeah. I think the question is beta, as you say, is not a positive combination of these H's. Right? So That's have, right. Uh, you basically use the fact that this ample cone is convex and, you know, there's a, uh, you know, real complex analysis part going on, right? You want to say that you don't make the eigenvalue zero when you go from yeah. cone to the beta. And That's then, right. Yeah. Uh, you're still using, as far as I remember, they had this fact that if one, if it is Hodgman for one point in the ample cone, it's Hodgman for everything, right? So you're still using that. Yeah, that's right. So that is not too hard to prove. And yeah, but the saying, yeah. um, that's like the key idea. Like we, we just got to show it for one of them. So why not show it for one of them in this very kind of special sub cone of the full ample cone mm -hmm. spanned by the positives? of the H sub Fs. Yeah, that's exactly right. 